Most of us in the room have read Tony Wagner's bio. Um, so I just really wanted to tell you two things about why it's a special treat for me to introduce him. Um, I got a call from Central America saying that uh, I think it was a, 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 the head of a school or a, a head of a, of a high school in Central America was nominating Tony for a global education prize and would I write a letter of recommendation. And so this came just a few weeks ago as I was thinking about what I wanted to say and I wrote her, I, th I think it's fair to say, I wrote her a pretty glowing note. But what I said to her was two things. The first is, is that when we started the 21st century skills movement in 2001, there were two books that defined and propelled the movement. Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat and Tony Friedman's The Global Achievement Gap. Friedman helped us understand the nature of the global economy, but I'm not sure any of you remember that he hardly touched the subject of education. It was Tony's book that really made it clear that education was an essential element and it created, the book created, an incredible dialogue between the education community and the business community about the future of education. And then the other thing I said is, is that since we started Ed Leader 21, Tony not only serves on the advisory committee, but not a month, literally not a month goes by where somebody from some school or district calls and says, I'm interested in Ed Leader 21, and Sarah Mobley or I will say, well, how did you hear about us? And she said, Tony Wagner told us we've got to find out about you. So Tony has not only been a great friend of Ed Leader 21, but I think we all feel has really been one of the two or three thought leaders that has really created the movement that we're riding, and we couldn't be more pleased to have him here. Please a warm welcome for Tony Wagner. Thanks for being here. Wow. Uh, now it's my turn to be choked up a bit. You know, I don't normally get nervous very much when I give talks, having done a few, but this group makes me nervous. You guys are without question the best leaders I've ever met in education. I've had the privilege of knowing some of you and working with a number of you over many years. And Ed Leader 21 is doing the most important work in education today. You know, I just write about it, you guys are doing it. So for me, to, to be very honest, it's pretty humbling to stand here in front of you. But let, let me try to at least uh, share a little bit of, of what I've been learning in, in my last five years as I reflect on challenges for you in the next five years of your work. When I wrote uh, The Global Achievement Gap, as Ken pointed out, I was really following on the coattails of Thomas Friedman who talked about a global knowledge economy. But I kept on talking to business and civic leaders after the book was published and gradually came to understand we don't have a knowledge economy anymore. Knowledge is a commodity. Computers collect, aggregate, analyze, and increasingly communicate knowledge. It's a commodity. There's no competitive advantage in knowing more than the person next to you because they'll Google it just in time. What we have today is an innovation economy. And the implications are even more profound for us and our work. Because you see, the world today no longer cares how much our kids know. That's a commodity. What the world cares about, what matters most, is what they can do with what they know. And that presents a profoundly different set of challenges for all of us in education. Beginning with problem number one. Problem number one is increasingly employers do not trust transcripts from anybody. High school, college, name brand college, whatever it is. They don't trust them because it tells them absolutely nothing about what a young person can do. Only about the amount of seat time they've served in various courses. Give an example of extraordinary transformation. Google, 
used to be famous or notorious, depending on your point of view, for only hiring kids from Ivy League schools, and they would only interview those kids who had the highest test scores and GPAs. Well, along comes Laszlo Bach, senior VP of People Operations. Being a good Googler, he analyzes the data and discovers that these indices are, quote, worthless, unquote. His words, not mine. He goes on to say the skills you need to succeed in a competitive, innovative economy bear absolutely no relationship to the skills you need to succeed in an academic context. Google threw those hiring guidelines out the window. You go to Google's job website today, the word college does not even appear. 15% of Google's new hires don't have a BA degree at all. And instead of asking for a transcript, you go through a series of steps where you have structured interviews, where they're trying to understand how you can deal with complex problems, how you can lead as well as follow, how you can learn through trial and error. It's a transformed world. And it's not just Google. I was in Ho Chi Minh City a year and a half ago at the invitation of Deloitte, the accounting and consulting firm. And before I spoke to area business leaders, I had lunch with the CEO. And quite spontaneously, she said to me, you know, we used to hire the best students from the best universities. But we don't do that anymore, she said, because it turns out they don't work out so well. <laughs> Now, she said, what we do is look for good students and we put them through a summer-long boot camp to see how they solve problems collaboratively. We're living in a radically different world. And one immediate consequence of this world is that kids are having, a, college graduates are having a harder and harder time finding decent employment. Liz Fagan and I were just comparing notes before the meeting started. Somewhere over 50% of our recent four-year college graduates are either unemployed or underemployed. What does underemployment mean? They are BA Ristas or BAR tenders. <laughs> Kids with BAs not earning a BA wage, which by the way has declined steadily since 2000. The average starting salary for a student with a four-year degree today is $36,000. And they go in with an average of $30,000 of debt, not counting their parent debt. No surprise then that according to a Gallup poll this week, only 38% of four-year recent college graduates said they decided that the whole college experience was worth it. 38%. We have to differently prepare our kids for the innovation era. And it's not about getting incrementally better at what we're already doing. As you well know, our education system had its founding in 1893 by the Committee of Ten, the dawn of the Industrial Era. Now we're at the innovation era. So I've been trying to understand what must we do differently to develop the capabilities of every young person to be an innovator. Now let me do a little definition here. There are two kinds of innovation I discovered. One kind is about bringing new possibilities to life. Now I think that's pretty rare. And that may be a more a matter of nature than nurture, of an extraordinary convergence of time and talent, like a Steve Jobs. Not everybody can be a Steve Jobs. But there's another kind of innovation that's at least as important. And that is someone who is a creative problem solver. You can have creativity without the ability to solve problems. Not, doesn't have much market value. You can be a problem solver but not be able to bring a creative element to that, a divergent thinking, a fresh question, and you're not going to add value. It's the creative problem solver who really are the most in demand all over the world, not just in high tech, but in social science services around the world. Because we have many problems to solve, as you know. So, you know, here's the deal. We are born curious, creative, imaginative. That is the human DNA. You all know that. The average four or five year old asks 100 questions a day, and nearly every kindergartner thinks of himself or herself as an artist. Right? But what happens? By the time most children are 11 or 12, they've stopped asking questions because they're worried about getting the right answers on the test. And almost none of them think of themselves as artists. So what must we do differently as educators and parents to develop the capabilities of many more of our young people to be creative problem solvers? 
to answer that question, I started interviewing a wide variety of young people, increasingly now around the world, all of whom were in their 20s, all of whom were and are creative problem solvers, but in different domains. Some are in STEM fields, some are social entrepreneurs, some are artists, some are from privilege, some are from poverty. Some are from the U.S., but I met a whole bunch in, in other countries as well. I tried to understand what had made the difference for them. How had they developed these capabilities? Asked them about their parents, about schooling. I interviewed all of their parents to see if I could discern patterns of parenting. Asked them about their schooling, and it, that led to my first very troubling discovery. Some of these kids had gone to our best, so-called, universities. Harvard, Stanford, NI, MIT, Carnegie Mellon. And they all told me they had become innovators in spite of their schooling, not because of it. Reinforcing exactly what Laszlo Bach found at Google. But I didn't accept that. I said, well, come on, tell me at least about a, a teacher who's made a difference in your lives. All could name at least one, rarely more than one or two. So I went and interviewed all of those teachers. That led to my second very troubling discovery. In every single case, the teachers who'd made the greatest difference in the lives of these young people, and some were as, as young as first grade teachers all the way to graduate school teachers, in every single case, though, they were outliers. Teaching in ways that were fundamentally different than their peers, yet remarkably similar to one another, I discovered, as I interviewed them and watched some of them teach. Then I spent time hanging out in those few schools that really do teach creative problem solving and teach it well. The brand new MIT Media Lab, the brand new Olin College of Engineering, the D School at Stanford, and then at younger grades, Envisions, Exploratory Learning, or Expeditionary Learning, High Tech High, New Tech High, and then younger still, Regimilia classrooms, Montessori classrooms, the Bing Nursery School on the campus of Stanford. And again, a pattern emerged. Across the board, I saw remarkably similar practices of learning and teaching across those schools, and a pattern that was completely consistent with what I'd learned from those outlier teachers. So here's what I've come to understand, and taken broadly, I think this represents the most fundamental next set of challenges collectively for all of us in education. Because you see, there's a fundamental set of contradictions between the culture of schooling as it emerged from 1893 versus the culture of learning to be a creative problem solver. Five contradictions I want to briefly touch on. Contradiction number one, culture of schooling is all about measuring and rewarding individual achievement, isn't it? Well, there's a time and a place for that, but here's the problem. Innovation is a team sport. There is no innovation without deep collaboration. You know this from your practices here with Ed Leader 21. Knowing this, these teachers of innovation created accountable teamwork with every single project, assessed students' abilities to collaborate as much as they assessed their individual work. They did 360 peer reviews of one another's contributions to the teams as students. And most importantly, these teachers team taught whenever they could because they believed, as do I, that isolation is the enemy of improvement. Isolation is the enemy of innovation. And one reason we've had so little innovation in education for the last century is because we have so much isolation. Contradiction number two. Contradiction number two is all about how in conventional schools we compartmentalize knowledge, subjects, and we favor specialization. Well, that's fine. There's a role for that. But here's the problem. Innovation happens at the boundaries of academic disciplines, never within them. Judy Gilbert, then director of talent at Google, said to me, if there's one thing educators must understand, it's that problems can neither be understood nor solved within the bright lines of individual academic disciplines. Knowing this, these teachers built courses around a big question or a big problem that could not be solved or addressed using just one academic discipline. Almost every course was multidisciplinary. Contradiction number three. It's about the culture of the classroom. Culture of classroom in too many places that I visit, especially high schools and colleges, it's a culture of passivity. It's a culture of consumption. 
where kids' jobs is to consume as much information as possible and then regurgitate it. It's a culture of infantilization, ultimately, because there's only one expert in the room, and that's the one at the front doing all the talking. Very different in the culture where you're learning to be a creative problem solver because there the emphasis on creating, not consuming. The emphasis is on empowering students. And the teacher sees his or her role as primarily that of a coach, coaching students to a higher performance standard. Contradictions four and five, I think, are the most challenging of all. But you see, contradiction four is all about the F word. No, not that one. Failure. Failure is the worst thing that can happen to anybody in school, and it's the number one bad dream or nightmare of most of us as adults. Fear of failure, I think, in fact, creates not just a culture of compliance, but a culture of severe risk aversion in education. Because we educators are not the only ones afraid. The kids are afraid, but we're also afraid. We're afraid of uh, looking bad in front of our peers, our kids, our parents, the principal, the superintendent leads to tremendous risk aversion. But here's, a, here's an stunning, stunning thing I learned. There is no innovation without trial and error. I went to IDO, the most famous design company of the world. They said, our company motto is fail early and fail often. Uh, don't take that back. They, they won't understand that back home. Other companies talk about failing fast, failing forward, failing cheap, but fail. Because it is only through trial and error that you iterate. I talked to a teacher at the D School at Stanford. He quite seriously said the following to me. He said, you know, I'm more and more thinking F is the new A. Now, don't take that back. It needs definite work. But it all became more clear when I talked to a young woman from the Olin College of Engineering. She said, you know, we don't talk about GPAs or worry about that much, but we obsess about iteration, my new favorite word going from 1.0 to 2.0. And think about the skills you need to iterate. You need to be able to critically analyze your own work. You need to be able to self-assess and help others assess their work. You need to be able to reflect on what went well and what didn't, and then apply that learning to your next project or your next course. But more deeply, I think we need to understand something profound here. There is probably no real learning without trial and error. How many of you have learned more from your mistakes than your successes? Raise your hands. Exactly. We all have. How many of us think for a moment about you know, how kids learn? What if we said to a kid, I'm sorry, you can't walk until you can walk in a straight line. None of this crawling business. No falling down. And oh, no speaking until you can speak in complete grammatically correct sentences. No trial and error here. And bicycling? Ah, that's out. Because we know you're going to fall and skin your knee. I think there is no real learning without trial and error. Important learning. So I'm coming more and more to think, and this is one of the challenges I would put forward to you, is to rethink grading. I really do mean I want to get rid of that F word in schools. The only failure that I can see is the failure not to show up, the failure not to try. Everything else, from my point of view, is work in process, incomplete. The only grades I can justify are A, B, or incomplete. A B, in my opinion, should be the performance standard for a credit in my course. Indeed, that's how I taught. That's the standard. You vary the amount of time or the amount of support a student may need to get that B, but that is the performance standard. It remains constant. Students' work is incomplete until it meets that performance standard. Then we reserve A's for real human excellence. And we assess people according to a body of work, which is what these teachers did in these schools. Never grading individual papers. Lots of feedback. But the assessment was of a body of work. And it was mostly for credit, no credit. This brings us to the last contradiction. That's about motivation. As you know, we rely very heavily on extrinsic incentives to motivate learning. Carrots and sticks. Rewards and punishments. The problem is this. What I discovered among so many young people whom I've interviewed, again, from both privilege and from poverty, is that they are far, far more intrinsically motivated. They did their best work in schools not to get an A, but because it was work worth doing. And as young adults, they're working incredibly hard not 
to get a quick raise or a promotion, but because they want to make a difference. Their parents and teachers had instilled one simple lesson, which we'll come to, but to really better understand how they had continued to strengthen and develop this intrinsic motivation, I went back and reanalyzed all of the interviews I had done. And I made my last discovery. Both parents and teachers had explicitly encouraged three things. Play, passion, and purpose. Parents encouraged much more exploratory play, fewer toys, toys without batteries. As young children, it's sand, clay, paint, blocks, water, and then everyone's favorite as they grew older, Legos. <laughs> Parents limited screen time to a significant degree. Teachers tried to bring a spirit of play back into the kinds of assignments they gave their students. Ed Carrier, who teaches engineering at Stanford, taught about bringing an element of whimsy into his curriculum design and the kinds of projects he gave his teams of students to work on. The extraordinary thing was, though, that as these kids grew older, these parents were very intentional about trying to give their kids, to the extent that they had resources to do so, new opportunities to explore new interests, to try new things. And here's the thing that was so interesting. You know, we've been talking a lot about grit, as well we should. Grit being more important than IQ for adult su success and well-being. But we haven't talked much about where grit comes from. Perseverance, tenacity, self-regulation, self-discipline, I have come to learn, are all best developed in the context of pursuing a real interest that can become a passion. And it begins with curiosity. Here's a simple idea for all of your students. Have them keep a question journal. So they go through their school day, their school week. Write down the questions that occur to them. Meet occasionally with them and say, well, what, of all these questions, what, what one might you want to pursue? Come to that in a moment. But curiosity begets interest, which can in turn develop into deep passion, which is how we develop those essential capabilities related to grit. But you know what happened was that these kids, their interests morphed and evolved as they became young adults. But in every case, they matured to a deeper sense of purpose, a desire to in some way give back or make a difference. And that's because both parents and teachers had instilled one simple lesson. The idea that we are not here on this earth just to serve ourselves. We have some responsibility to give back and to make a difference. Well, Ken and the folks at Ed Leader 21 asked me to sort of try to put forward what I see as some challenges for you in your work in the next five years. So let me conclude with a couple. Challenge number one. We all understand content matters. Sometimes I've been mischaracterized as someone who favors skills at the expense of content. It's not true. What I favor is the content that matters that be taught. The content that students will need and retain six months after the course is over. So content matters to orient us to the world, to what's gone before us, to know what's around us. But skills matter more. The world doesn't care how much you know. Google knows everything. What the world cares about is what you can do with what you know. So skills matter more. But motivation, I've come to learn, matters most. Because the person who is intrinsically motivated will continuously learn new skills and new content throughout his or her life, as indeed you must in the innovation era. So I want to be able to walk into any classroom in your district and see evidence in the class of careful attention to all three. What content is being taught? How important is it? Would it? Why? Who selected this content? What criteria? What skills are being taught? How are they being assessed? And finally, are students being given work worth doing? Is it encouraging curiosity and intrinsic motivation? Secondly, going further out from that, I want us to rethink the meaning of diplomas, high school diploma middle school, elementary. Right now, today, a diploma is mostly a certificate of seat time served. It means you've gone through the requisite number of Carnegie units, a system that was devised in 1893, named after Carnegie because he decided he would fund every teacher's retirement program for schools that adopted this. Did you know that? TIA CREF was funded by Carnegie as a bribe. 
Today, a certificate, a diploma, should not be of seat time served. It should be a certificate of mastery. So I'd like to see a high school diploma be a collection of merit badges. Merit badges in the four C's. I'd have our friendly amendment, because I know you're struggling with creativity. Let's call it creative problem solving. Lots of ways you can show proficiency in the standard of creative problem solving. So let's have a series of merit badges. Let's have a series of performance standards. Let's bring the community and employers and college teachers in to help us set those performance benchmarks and standards so that a high school diploma means something besides four years of seat time served. And they can be all kinds of merit badges and they can vary from communities to communities. Some communities want, may, may want every kid to have a merit badge in entrepreneurship. Others may be something different. And all kids should have merit badges and demonstrating that they can think like a scientist, a mathematician, a historian. The uh, New York Performance Standards Consortium has been doing this for 20 years and has gotten uh, permission to not give New York Regents exams in lieu of students having to present and defend their work to a performance standard. State of New Hampshire, first state in the country to say you no longer have to have Carnegie units to graduate. You can instead demonstrate proficiencies. And here's the really hot and exciting news. Several months ago, the US Department of Education gave the first waiver to New Hampshire to work with local school districts, two so far, to develop local performance standards in lieu of testing. It's historic. I'd love to come back here in five years and see every one of you involved in one of those kinds of consortia, because it's going to free up enormously in the next few years. States are going to have far more leeway and latitude. But the fact that New Hampshire, very traditional state, has taken the lead in this, I find inspiring and encouraging. Needless to say, if we're going to move in this direction, every student should have a digital portfolio that follows them through school, which is a collection of work that shows evidence of growing proficiency over time. And all students should have to present and defend their work. And you'll see an incredible example of that tonight in the film, uh, Most Likely to Succeed. High Tech hey, High, a school that is entirely based on the idea of students presenting and defending their work through exhibitions of mastery to a public audience. Two more modest proposals. I want to see every school, every district, have an innovation fund. A fund that is set up, maybe it's a part of your professional development money, where teams of teachers can apply for grants to develop digital portfolios, to develop digital portfolios as a way of assessing teachers. Digital portfolios that are maybe peer-reviewed in neighboring districts. To develop interdisciplinary courses. Why teams of teachers? Because isolation is the enemy of innovation. Teams of teachers will iterate more quickly and take more risks. Teams of teachers applying to innovation funds for how to continue to explore teaching and assessing the four C's. Lastly, to the issue of motivation. How many of you know about Google time? Raise your hands. Good. Some people hear about Genius Hour, different kinds of things. You know, if you work for Google, you have permission to play on company time a day a week. And it's not just Google. 3M has been doing it for 40 years. Giving folks time to work on projects around which they have a passion has been a, a powerful engine of innovation for those companies that have done it. How many of you use post-it notes? Well, that's because one of the, the engineers at 3M got very intrigued with this glue that didn't quite stick. Hence, we have post-it notes. What if, what if we said to every student when they started school, you're going to have a certain percentage of your time where you are the architect of your own learning. Maybe it's only a period at the end of the week. Maybe it's a mini semester between semesters. Lots of different ways to do it. I've had emails from lots of teachers trying it. A high school teacher emailed me recently saying, you know, I've made every Friday Google time. She, he said, the amazing thing that's happened. He said, I've had to completely rethink how I see and assess my students. Because first Friday, the kids in the front of the room all just stood there like that. They didn't know what to do. Kids in the back of the room were normally half asleep. We were totally alive and awake with all kinds of things they wanted to do. Fifth grade teacher emailed me. She said, you know, and I've told my students that I'm no longer giving them academic weekend homework. Instead, it's going to be their Google time. 
She said the first Monday they came back, she was stunned. She, was, she could not believe the energy in the room. One student had spent the entire weekend looking at YouTube videos in order to learn how to play the guitar. Another student had cooked three new entire meals that he wanted to explore. A young woman of Asian descent had explored her Chinese background, which she had never had a chance to explore previously. This teacher said she had never seen such an excitement and, and a curiosity in her classroom. So let me stop at this point, because I really want to hear your questions, your comments, because that's what I'll learn from. So I'm going to stop and invite you, I think there are going to be a couple of mics in the back, if they aren't already, to come with your questions, your comments. While you do that, I'm getting a glass of water. <laughs> Now, come on, you know I'm a recovering high school English teacher. I know all about wait time. We got 15 minutes here, guys. <laughs> Two mics right there. Line them up. I ask only, please, that you keep your question or comment brief so we can get as many as, as we well, can. Hi, Tony. Before. My name is Jim Stelter, Bensonville District 2, Suburban Chicago. You talked about play, passion, and purpose. How do you see that possibly aligning with a community school model to try to really engage the community around the challenges that at-risk school systems? I'm 70% low income, 70% Hispanic. Thank you. Whew. I said be quick, but not that quick. <laughs> wow. How do I see play, passion, and purpose aligning with the challenges particularly in, in low income, high minority communities? Is that the question? And a community school model. And a community school model. Can you say another word about how the community school model, what, what, how does that interact with the, what I've just said? Well, the idea that it takes a nice and loud so people can hear you. The idea that it takes a village to Got it. kids get up and, and to build great determination and, and you find their passion and purpose. Yeah. Well, you know, if we go to the idea that a diploma is a merit badge, not a certificate of seat time served, and we backwards map that to end of eighth grade and end of fifth grade, then learning suddenly becomes 24-7, 365. And it doesn't have to happen in a classroom with a teacher. You can, you can have a mentor. You can have a coach. You can be out doing an internship. So suddenly, opportunities for learning are dramatically expanded if we think beyond the confines of a classroom and the conventional teaching role model. And I think particularly, I spent my first five years working with the most at-risk high school kids in a certain area. And I learned from that that those are the kids who, in fact, need to find and pursue a passion even more than some other kids. Why? Because they need hope, and they need a reason to learn. And if they don't have a real interest, at least the beginning, the spark of an interest, and it took me sometimes six months to help these kids find their interest, but if they don't have one, they don't have a reason to come to school at all. Other questions or comments? Thank you. That was a great one. I don't see anybody lined up. What's the story here? Ah, they're waiting for cocktail hour. <gasps> I'm, I'm keeping you, aren't I? Oh, dear, you've had a long day. It's true. But come on, a couple more questions. Hi. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Michael Storsley from Leiden High Schools, just outside of Chicago. Um, how do you think your model, or what you're suggesting, jibes with the push toward advanced placement courses? Uh, I have to go now. I hear my airplane calling me. <laughs> my question. To, to the credit of, uh, of David Coleman and other folks, they are trying to change AP courses. But they are running up against tremendous opposition from college teachers who are deeply, deeply wedded to their content. But there's a countervailing trend of more and more colleges no longer giving credit for AP courses, Dartmouth being the most recent. So I think, you know, for me, the best solution is the one I found at Scarsdale High School. Anybody here from Scarsdale? Well, what Scarsdale did, it took them a couple of years, but the teachers rebelled at the high school, said, look, we are tired of stuffing the goose. We're not going to do that anymore. Oh, my goodness, the parents were so upset. The school board, blah, blah, blah. It took them two years. But what they said is, look, let us create an advanced topics curriculum working closely with college teachers. What a radical idea. They did that. You know what happened to their admission to the most selective schools? And this, by the way, 60% of their kids go to the most selective schools. That's why the parents were so up in arms. But you know what happened? Their admission to those most selective schools went up, not down. 
We don't need AP, and AP does not need us. <laughs> Other questions? Concerns, <laughs> disagreements. Yes, please. So, my, my Conley Palmer, Western Connecticut. My question was very much aligned with the intersection of K through 12 education and higher ed, and how the misalignment, when we um, use all of the best practices in K through 12, student choice, authentic learning, performance-based assessment, and when the rubber meets the road, it's all about the college application mm -hmm. and the pressure that our kids face at the secondary level corrupts and contaminates yes. the work that we do. And so if you have any advice for how we can bridge that besides just the AP example you gave, I would be most yes. appreciative. Well, first of all, we have to engage parents. I've been to Weston. I know your community. And the first thing Weston parents need to understand is, yes, all of their children are stunningly talented and all of them are above average, <laughs> but very few will ever go to an Ivy League school. The demographics are against them. They're too white and too rich. If you really want your kids to go to a, uh, an Ivy League school, this is what I tell parents, you better move back to your reservation in North Dakota and have your child discover the cure for cancer while taking four varsity sports. <laughs> then maybe you'll have a shot. So quite seriously, the odds of kids getting into these kinds of schools, as you know, is less than 5%. But there are more than 850 schools and colleges that are completely test optional. Good schools, Middlebury, Bowdoin, Bates, Colby, Mount Holyoke. There are a lot of selective schools that don't require an SAT or an AP exam. And more and more colleges are open to looking at student work. Bard College recently just said, if you can write four essays to our performance standard, you are automatically admitted to Bard. We don't even care if you have a high school diploma. They admitted a, a significant number of kids on that standard a year ago, and they did just fine. So I think we're going to see movement in, in a different direction. If for no other reason, the colleges have to prove today that they can add value. A prestigious diploma is not worth anything in the way that it once was. Recent research from Gallup and Purdue working on this very important study of college graduates discovered that where you went to school, college that is, no improvement in income by your middle age, Yes, right out of college, you earn a higher initial salary. No imp improvement by middle age. And most importantly, it didn't, where you went to college did not impact your career. You know what did, though? What you did in college, that's what mattered. That's what made the difference. Not where you go, it's what you do when you get there. Most of our leading business and community leaders went to state schools. So I finally say to parents, like those at Weston, Worry about graduate school if you want to worry about something. Send your kids to a good state school and save up for graduate school because there it does matter where you go. Last question, I guess we have two more questions and we gotta stop. All right, Nevada, California, Nevada Unified School District. My question is around student collaboration and engaging parents in that. So common question of parents, my student does all the work, yep. so they're not learning anything. What do we say to them? Yep. Well, I'd suggest you talk to Rick Lear here, who worked at New Tech High. They were one of the very first schools that developed rubrics for students to do peer review in their teams. That's one simple solution. When students know they're being peer reviewed and that they're going to be assessed by their peers on what they did or did not contribute to the project and the team, things begin to change. Secondly, you cold call. You don't say, okay, now you team, you pick the person who's going to present your project. No, you don't. Say, Steve, tell me what your team did and what you contributed to it. You cold call when you have teams working together. There's two simple things I've seen work. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Deb Kerr, Brown Deer, Wisconsin. And for those of you who understand what's going on in terms of the politics in Wisconsin, we've had a little bit of conflict and controversy um, as of late. Um, and so how, how would you recommend that we help our legislators understand the connections to learning and what learning should look like to best prepare yes. our kids for their future? I, I think that's a really important question to end with because it goes right back to the incredibly pioneering work Ken did beginning in 2001, Ken and his colleagues at the partnership. Look, we got what I call accountability 2.0, not because policymakers woke up someday and said, let's think about how to torture teachers. <laughs> they might have, but no. It was because of business leadership. People like David Kearns at Xerox, Lou Gerstner at IBM. Business leaders began lobbying 
They had a national conference in 1996, in fact. All the CEOs came, all the governors came. You know how many educators came? This many. And they were invited as observers only. So we got accountability 1.0 on the backs of educators, but we got it because business applied pressure. Now the problem we have today is that too many business leaders say, well, I'm running a multinational or I'm investing in robotics, doesn't matter so much anymore. We need to find local business leaders who will ally with us and who will be very, very clear about the outcomes that matter most. This is one of our most important tasks. We have to be proactive and advocate for accountability 2.0 with our business and civic leaders. Get them to help clarify what are the outcomes that matter most and get them to lobby for an accountability system aligned with those outcomes. That's incredibly important work for the future. Folks, um, hard to know how to end a conversation like this. You know, I... Uh, being a recovering high school English teacher, I'm somewhat obliged to quote literature at some point, as some of you may know. But uh, you all, I'm sure, because you had such great English teachers, remember the opening to Tale of Two Cities, don't you? No? I'm hurt. I'm shocked. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. These are extraordinarily challenging times in education. I don't need to tell you that. You live it. You know it. You live it every single day. And that's why, for me, frankly, being here is so powerful and so moving. Because what I see in this audience is also the best of times. You are the leaders for the future of education. The work you are doing is creating the new frameworks, the new ways of thinking, the new ways of learning, teaching, and assessing that we desperately need. You are doing the educational research and development that our country so desperately needs. Thank you for what you're doing for your kids, your teachers, your community, and the future of our country. Thank you.